So we opened the discussion and um, let, let me open it. Uh, we had several talks about the wings and so on. So the first time I saw the wing um, was this picture. This is a paper from 95. Anybody recognize who is the first author? Okay, you can guess. Raghvendra Sahai, the first author, with two other authors. And uh, this is, um, you see here a nice bipolar flow with, with the disc, and you see here many, many rings. And uh, this is a title, okay? Um, two are more, more than two authors. Imaging of the egg nebula, okay? And they find here rings and so on. So we, we are also well, very much interested in this. Can you see uh, this? Um, do you see the new paper here that I presented? This is a paper of Harpaz, who yes. passed away several years ago, and Rappaport and myself, the ring around the egg nebula, and we try to explain it. So we have all the, you know, the buzzword, you know, uh, uh, on the other hand, if the companion star is sufficiently close, the Roche lobe of the AGB star moving inside the extended atmosphere. We did not talk about, we don't call it wind, we call it the acceleration region of the wind, which is 10 times or even more than the AGB star. And then the Roche lobe overflow, a critical potential surface, the Roche lobe flow uh, over. So it's not the AGB star itself, but the acceleration zone of the wind fills the Roche lobe overflow, and this, by eccentric orbit, modulates the massless weight. So I'm very happy to see the great distance so, that we made from this, uh, you know, first suggestion of eccentric orbits and wind uh, acceleration zone to these very high, uh, sophisticated simulations. And this is my opening, and I see that Adam has something to say. So please go ahead, Adam. Uh, can you guys hear me? I'm driving. I got to go teach. So my... yes, okay. So drive okay. carefully. Yes. <laughs> Don't stare at the screen. Um, I'm actually interested in those bipolar outflows that you pointed out because um, it's true. Cooling, cooling may kill them. But I would also perhaps expect that um, you would have just had a fat torus, uh, you know, that these, those things might have gone into orbit. Um, and so there, there may be a reality to those, um, uh, you know, even with uh, better cooling. And the interesting thing about them is in the simulations that uh, Joe did back uh, a while ago, we also, you know, we found that the interaction between the, the companion and the AGB star could produce a binary or could produce a bipolar outflow at around 30 kilometers per second, 20 kilometers per second. So I don't think that's unrealistic. And um, I guess I just wanted a little bit more comment or a little discussion. It's one of the stimulate a little discussion on these. There, there, you know, there is observational evidence, as Joe showed, for lower velocity bipolar outflows during the AGB phase. And um, uh, it looks like we have a couple of mechanisms now, perhaps to, to explore those. So I'll end it there. That was just a comment. Okay, any more comments? Um, yes, anybody? I have one comment uh, uh, to the previous speaker. I was just wondering about the exactly these outflows that uh, were emerging, and uh, you say something about um, the ASPH particles. They were gaining a lot of energy, so I was just wondering because it's an ASPH. If that, if that, I mean, at least some part of it, it would be because of the code. So what about if you, if you had it with an HD code, a grid code? Would that change? I mean, I don't know if it makes sense, but I was just thinking about that. I, I don't think that it's because of the difference between SPH of grids. It's just because, because of that, the cooling things and that okay. it's the temperature there. I don't think it's SPH of grids related. And now, uh, because of the, like you mentioned, that the cooling is not efficient in, the, in your simulation. So are you planning to... Uh, 
you know, go forward with the cooling or what are your plans on that? Yes, other people are, are actually working on that. There was a master student who did a thesis on that, but uh, yeah, they, they tried out some cooling, but then the cooling didn't work actually in the region where it had to, so that didn't do much. Um, but yeah, they are like the, the people at ULB are working on improving the entire model by including dust and, and pulsation and, and everything. And then Silk is also planning to, to really add uh, chemistry to the model such that they become really realistic. It might take some time, but it's definitely yeah. something that is going on. <laughs> And I, I'm just uh, wondering this thing because uh, I'm I'm used to uh, the SPH code uh, for when you want to include gas, but in the galaxy um, scale. So when it's something uh, like, uh, I don't know, in, in smaller scale and you can have the eye draw and you can have an exact end body, I, I just... I don't know. I I know that is a uh, uh, something that is easier in the numerical part when you have an SPH to integrate everything. But uh, maybe I'm I'm just uh, biased because of that. But uh, but I just when I hear SPH is I don't know like I always tend to think like maybe it changes something when it's an hydro with an embody like a real embody. Yeah. I, I only work. But it's just uh, my my biased personal bias. Thank you. No problem. Yeah, I only want did to you, did you want to say, to say something about the code? Uh, no, not really. I was just listening because I've worked a lot with Jolene, so I was waiting. Maybe I could okay. jump in. But it's what Jolene said. Uh, people are working to improve the code and include decent cooling and everything. So we are working on improved models. Mm -hmm. And we're also this curious is about phantom results. Code. Phantom yeah. code is, is the name, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Nice. I mean, it's a great work. I mean, it was really nice to hear one after the other. <laughs> I cannot, lucky. I still, I don't know. I, it's just because I'm used to other things. It's not nothing uh, more academic than that, my personal bias. But it's a great work. No, no, me. I think that that's, that's not unreasonable. I mean, for, when, when you're seeing things that you're not sure of, I mean, there's definitely SPH, just like grid codes, can add things, especially around boundary conditions. So for something like this, it's worthwhile using both kinds of codes for it, especially since the physics is relatively yeah. simple. So, Yes, I was thinking about that. Uh, what if uh, just uh, an hydro simulation just to have a, <laughs> just to, I don't know, just. Someone should do it. Yeah, I agree. Yes. <laughs> Project for someone. Yes, yes. But, I would uh, exclude this as an effect of SPH, if I can speak for Phantom. We, this, this particular effects, I mean, you, it can be to do with the party, point particle usage or whatever, but no, it's not SPH. We have tested extensively phantom against flash and against um, Enzo. So we do grid and SPH in common envelope situations, which are quite stringent uh, with just gravity though. So no other effects. And there's a remarkably consistent results. In fact, surprisingly consistent mm -hmm. results. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I it. For me, it's a new quantum code. I, sorry, sorry. No, it's, yeah, it's pretty new. I mean, it's been around for a while, but the method paper is 2018. But uh, Daniel has a remarkable user group um, and there's very, very, very good code in terms of usability. Uh, and, you know, you can open it and it's extremely user friendly. And yeah. Daniel is really great, and the group is great. So it's actually one of those community projects that's just fun to be with. But can I ask a quick question to Jolene and also to Silke? I mean, dust is going to make a mess of those envelopes in addition to your companion. And I know that uh, Lionel has been adding uh, dust to Phantom in exactly those settings. So did you try switch the module on? You mean try out the test implementation already? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's in there. You just have to, and I'm sure the setup is very similar because you're doing a GB win, so you have an inner boundary and... Yeah, I, I didn't try it yet, but maybe Lionel has to, so maybe I should ask him if he, if he tried it already. Because it's going to change things remarkably, right, if you add yes. that, that. Yeah, and that's why we also thought it was good to first do these purely hydrodynamic models to see what this already gives and then add the other things to see their effects. Thank you. Um, 
Hi, I, I, I have a question for Sil Silka. Um, so you mentioned the sling shot, sling shot uh, mod uh, effect, right? In your yeah. talk. And uh, I think uh, that's uh, a major effect for angular momentum transfer in, in binary interaction. Am I correct? Uh, that could very well be, but I haven't really looked into angular momentum and stuff in the models. I mostly looked just at the velocity and, and brainstormed what could be the cause of the yeah yeah, yeah, of yeah. The because velocity. you after one slingshot, your one of the particle gain velocity and the other uh, reduce if you sit in a fixed frame of reference. And mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I I I also. Uh, find that this this phenomenon usually are valid for particles, real particles, for example, rocks, and uh, maybe dust in in some tenuous gas. But for gas, this sling shot is not uh, significant uh, because of because gas can be compressed. After compression, the is irreversible. The after compression, the entropy change and everything usually change and uh, you deform, the gas particle can deform. But in SPH, uh, this is not modeled. So um, yeah, actually after a slingshot of, of a gas parcel, it could collide with another gas parcel if you, your gas parcel is dense enough and then it can form a shock. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's the uh, maybe it's a comment or a question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I have to think about it, but I will definitely register it in my head and think about it later because, yeah, it might be a consequence of SPH. But yeah, of course, the particles still interact with each other in SPH uh, via this smoothing kernel and stuff. So. It should be incorporated, I think. Yeah. Yeah, more comments and to other other talks today on the rings. Anybody wind collision? Um, so I, I will have a comment on, on those simulations that have any type of accretion or mass. A transfer that if if we have an equation this I expect jets and we see them in observation so um, I, I would ask, do we have any planetary nebula without jet shaping besides those spherical or something it, because if in most cases we have jets maybe Grandra has something to say tells us that we do have mass transfer or accretion at least during part of the time, always part of the time, not always. So this, if we see jets, it tells us that mass transfer, mass accretion is very important, not only wind collision in other cases, even in Eta Carina, which we have wind collision now, we had an accretion. So in all these cases of mass transfer, we might expect maybe jets, I don't know. Well, I think that you have to have jets, otherwise you cannot produce the kind of structures and velocity fields that we see during the pre-planetary nebula phase. And of course, the morphologies between pre-planetary nebulae and young planetary nebulae are so similar, it's hard to imagine that the pre-planetary nebulae, you know, which have, and other people have imaged in surveys, are not evolving into the planetary nebulae, which we see. So, I mean, accretion and accretion disformation and jets are absolutely critical to the shaping of or, and the shapes that we see in this stage. I, uh, can we agree? Yeah. Sorry, Joe. Yeah. Can we agree that um, in the early stages that are modeled by Silk and Jolene, that likely isn't enough accretion to make jets? And only later on, if there is an evolution of the orbit, um, or if the orbit is smaller or closer in the first place, you might have more accretion due to most significant mass transfer um, methods like Rochelle overflow, and then you have the jets. So the jets, which is on layer, 
because in all these ALMA images, you see all these spiral and it's asymmetries, but you don't really see, or maybe you wouldn't, I don't understand these observations very well, but you wouldn't see a trace of a jet or a, something that indicates that. But um, also I, I, I think I, I can answer uh, or say something about this question. So, so I, I think uh, when there is a accretion disk, uh, around a main sequence star or a compact object, there, yes, uh, if there is accretion ma uh, material falling onto the uh, object, I, I think there should be a, a, an outflow, associated outflow induced either by a magnetic ro rotational, uh, magnetically rotationally instability, magnetic rotationally instability, MRI, or uh, some others, but the other mechanism is very usually very weak. The others usually infer to frictional or turbulent motion. But in in this case, in this case, if the accretor is a white dwarf, is quite high, hot, is quite hot, and the inner disk should be ionized, as you can see in some of my simulation, the temperature raise rise to more than seven or eight hundred. 8,000 Kelvin. And then um, some of them maybe is ionized. And after that, the MRI can operate sufficiently. And you transport angular momentum, you accrete. But on the other hand, you have jet from the polar direction. You should have. Nowadays, we don't model the jet because this is a very, if you want to model it self consistently in a binary. In, in, uh, in, to include the mass transfer and accretion and the jet at the same time is very difficult self-consistently. But in reality, compared to theory and observation, yes, I, I do think wherever there is a, a high accretion rate, accretion disk, there should be a jet. Okay. Also, to answer your question, on, as an observer, I did this survey what of with HST of what I call nascent preplanetary nebulae. I reported that in several APNE meetings. And there you see in these stars, which are AGB stars, you see these collimated structures appearing in the center. So you, you already do start seeing the jets, but they're not as, or the effect of the jets, but they're not as developed as you see in the, during the preplanet nebula phase. So pre, I think that this jet formation occurs at the very late AGB phase uh, and becomes more visible than the object is a preplanetary nebula. Are these the objects for which the companion is particular, more massive, closer? Or... We don't know anything about the companion. We're just seeing the, the structures, but we're seeing these jet-like or collimated structures in, in these is, AGB is it only Is it only a few objects? Well, the survey was small. It was, uh, and half of them showed these collimated structures. I mean, there's a lot of dust obscuration, so you know it's difficult to see. Observation is difficult to see. Yeah. Any more comments or direction? Anybody? Uh, so okay, we will wait one minute just to be sure nobody. Um, I did not read the Slack, so I don't know if there are comments there. Anybody? would like to bring a comment from the Slack, so. I did put a comment in the Slack in reference to Muhammad's talk. And yeah. what I said was that you had emphasized that it's not enough to compare morphologies. You have to compare kinematics and other observables too. So as I, I maybe, unless I missed it, I didn't see much discussion of the kinematics from the models which Muhammad was doing for the planetary nebula with ears and whether we have the observations at least for a few objects to look at the velocity field in the nebulae to see if the, the velocities also match what you're coming, what you're getting from the Mars. Yeah, it's true. You need to do kinematics and also not only the shape but the density to see. Correct. Because in the ears we see low, low density. So yeah, Muhammad might uh, do more work in, in that comparison. I would add that we see also ears in supernova remnants, which is very interesting. But I will not get into it. Uh, okay. Yes, Joel. Yeah, I guess as long as we're talking about Joel, conversations, Joel, we're going what to... happened to you to your camera? And everybody, you know, I got here 
tens of emails, people asking me what happened to your camera. To my, oh, okay, all right, hang on, wait a second. No, Ten really, I, yes. my, you know, I, my computer was flooded with emails, everybody would like to see you. <laughs> yeah, my, my fan base is large, no, I understand. But my computer connection's very slow, so I don't know if this is even gonna work right now. Um, my wife Amy and I are both on Zoom, so I don't know how, the, how this is gonna work, but um, anyway, okay. yeah. <laughs> Okay, so ask your question, make, make your comment. Yeah, now, now you made me lose my NGC 7027 graphics, so, that, so I've got nothing to show, but um, yeah, okay. I was just, all I was gonna do is point out the interesting conversation that was going on in Slack about the, um, the different varieties of circumbinary structures, and I have to be careful because Raghavandra, I think correctly pointed out that when we are talking about disks, we probably mean Keplerian or quasi-Keplerian bound structures, whereas we're, when we're talking about equatorial structures that are not bound, we are better off talking about them as tori or toruses. But um, there are, you know, are, I think are sort of three different classes that seem to be emerging. One are compact um, accretion disks that might drive very fast jets. Another is sort of, um, large protoplanetary disk-like circumbinary structures that are hundreds or thousands of AU across. And then um, there is the, the expanding molecular torus that I guess, you know, I, I might coin the term failed disk. It's a, an expanding equatorial molecular structure, uh, molecule-rich structure that we see around bipolar nebulae. So anyway, and I guess it's still, you're still not seeing me. So, you know, I'm gonna turn my camera off. No, no, we, we see you, yes. Oh, okay. Good. That's odd. I don't see myself, which is maybe good. <laughs> okay. Luke, please. Yeah, hi. Um, this is kind of a naive question, but I was just wondering because someone mentioned that if you have jets, then uh, you have accretion. But the kinds of jets we're talking about, I mean, there's kind of jet-like structures in some cases, right? And there's this other idea that uh, you can get an outflow at the center that's confined and uh, forced to move along the along the poles, right? So, would that really be? That's not accretion necessarily. That that could be an outflow caused by something else, correct? And that that would still be termed a jet in observations, or yeah, uh, yeah, but people... but usually they are not. They cannot precess, and um, we. I, I don't know. I I'm not sure. These are the jet we see. When we see jet, many times we see multipolar, for example. Raghavandra like did many uh, papers on seeing more, and there, there are posters of seeing more. I even Joel put a poster of, that you see not only two lobes, you see several pairs of lobes. This, this, any co large collimation doesn't work. No, you need small really, disk yeah. inside. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think most of them, they're cliche. There are some collimation, but I don't think, it, give the shape of a jet but maybe wide lobe or something but even in the wide lobes we see precession of something working right. inside thanks if there are no comments i will add, uh, end with a personal comment so just to tell the young people what happened 25 years ago in 96 so then in planetary nebula, uh, planetary nebula meeting, the main argument about shaping was whether it's a single um, or binary stars. And in 96, I put, put a poster, this is the first meeting I uh, was with Ursula in the same meeting. And they, these are the big, I mean the largest debate, single or binary stars. So now I'm happy to see we are still there fighting whether it's a binary or triple system. So. We are do doing good. Okay, thank you, but thank you very much to everybody, and we will meet in one hour. Martin, will you send the new? Yes, thing? I I send the link, and I just ask uh, people to uh, turn off the mix and clap to all the speakers in this session. I'll be sending the the link uh, shortly for the next session. Thank you very much, everybody.